I want to begin my message here this morning in asking, where do we find God today? In Matthew 2, we read that the Magi followed a star 2,000 years ago, and it led them to Bethlehem, and they found God there. But there seem to be few such stars today. So where do we find God? In Matthew 3, we meet God in repentance and in baptism, in the convergence of God's law and God's gospel, in the convergence of God's commands and God's grace. And I believe that that's where we can find God today. Maybe we can't find God the way that Magi did, but we can find God through the ministry of the commands of God in our lives and the grace of God. In Matthew 3, we're introduced to two key persons in God's new exodus, in God's new deliverance, in His new salvation, coming out of the desert, just like the Israelites after their exodus from Egypt, coming out of the desert dressed in Elijah-like garments and baptizing Israelites in the Jordan River of all places, comes John the baptizer. And the other person who comes on the scene is the long-expected one, the Messiah, the King, the Christ. You know, when the Israelites in the first century heard the word Christ, it meant King, the long-expected one, the one that was promised from David's line. Like in chapter 3 of Matthew, verse 1, it says, In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, And then in verse 13 of Matthew 3, then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. And in the original Greek, the word came is the historical present, which not only signifies that these two men came 2,000 years ago, but their ministry still come into our lives today and can be experienced by us. I believe that in significant ways, John the Baptist represents the law of God and Jesus represents the gospel of grace. Even though John the Baptist's ministry has grace in it and and Jesus' ministry also has law in it, but when you look at their ministry as a whole, you could see that John the Baptist's ministry is more uh, characterized by law and Jesus' ministry by grace. In all four gospels, The ministry of the adult Jesus is always preceded by John the Baptist. Always. And I don't think that's an accident. He prepares the way to encounter Jesus the Christ. Jesus the Messianic King. Uh, Frederick Dale Bruner writes, Whenever the gospel comes in its depths, it follows the proclamation of the law in its heights. Without law, there's no gospel. Without the... Old Testament, no New Testament. And without John the Baptist proceeding or preceding, we do not rightly hear Jesus following. John comes on like the prophet of the Hebrew Scriptures and is a kind of walking, uh, breathing law of God, full of doom and holiness and ultimacy. I really believe that before we can fully appreciate and receive who Jesus is and what he offers, we need to encounter John the baptizer. Uh, Like in Galatians 3 verse 24, it says, So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ that we might be justified by God. Unless we uh, uh, understand that we can't meet God's holiness on our own, unless we see through the ministry of God's law in our hearts and our lives and how, how much broken we are, we're not going to see our need for gospel or Jesus. It's interesting, like, reading just how John the Baptist came in Matthew 3, verses 1 to 6. It says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. It seems like unless John the Baptist's ministry uh, came on the scene and unless the people made their path straight, they would not have encountered the King Jesus. John's clothes were made of camel's hair and he had a leather 
belt around his waist. And that reminds us of Elijah in 2 Kings 1 verse 8. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in, in the Jordan River. It's interesting in, in how in the last 20 years, how many mission organizations around the world when they see people come to know Christ and they're in areas where there's not much history of Christianity, these mission organizations, the way they're beginning to disciple these new Christians and teach God's Word is by beginning in Genesis and teaching about how God is the Creator of all things and we're accountable to Him and then talking about the fall of man in Genesis 3 and then God's calling of Abraham in Genesis 12 and how God promised him descendants and to be a blessing to the whole world. And then how God answered that prayer in the old age of Abraham and Sarah. And then as the Israelites uh, multiplied, they, they had to go down to Egypt and follow the leadership of Joseph because of a famine. And then through the exodus and through uh, after bondage to Pharaoh and being put to death, their male babies, they were brought through the Red Sea and then given the Ten Commandments. And then the history of uh, God's dealing with the Israelites and how they always fell short of faithfulness in their covenant relationship with God. Unless we know that background, when we read about Jesus, there's no context for his ministry. And it's interesting how Matthew in his gospel tries to connect us to that past history of God's dealing with the Jewish people. You know, the gospel starts off with the genealogy of Jesus. And it sh tries to uh, show clearly how Jesus is, the, is, is from the, the, the king of David's line. He's, from, he's the son of Abraham. And so the promises that were given to Abraham and to King David, we're meant to see, are being fulfilled in Jesus. And so we see here, before Jesus' ministry begins, here in Matthew 3... John the Baptist's ministry occurs. And according to Matthew, John the Baptist can do a great deal. He can preach God's law of repentance. He can prepare the way. He can baptize. He can receive confession of sins. And best of all, he can point to Christ, the fulfillment of the law and the prophets of the Old Testament. But you know what John can't do? John, John's ministry of law cannot forgive sins or give the Spirit. Uh, Bruner puts it this way, even John's magnificent ministry cannot remove our main problem, which is indwelling sin, or in part our major resource, the Spirit of God. This is going to take a further ministry. Like John the Baptist's ministry is more like the prophet, prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel of the Old Testament. But we need the ministry of the Anointed One the Messiah, Jesus, within us. And so in Matthew 3, verses 11 and 12, uh, John the Baptist even realizes this for himself. He says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to, to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And his winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And, and so Jesus, his ministry, he brings the Holy Spirit and a ministry that comes right into our heart and life. And I believe this is why John responds the way he does to Jesus when Jesus comes to be baptized by John the Baptist. You know, John the Baptist is saying here in verse 13 and 14, I don't, you don't need my water baptism. I need your baptism of the Holy Spirit. Like in verse 13 uh, of Matthew 3, then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? John realizes he himself needs what Jesus has to offer. And, and, and Jesus replies in verse 15, let it be so now, it's proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. 
the first point I want to make in this message that I believe I've just made is that we need both the ministry of God's law in our lives and God's gospel of grace if we are going to encounter God and meet God in our lives. Unless we see how far, we, far short, short we are of God's glory and how in our own strength we cannot serve God but need a work in our, ourselves, we're not going to consistently be able to experience the presence of God in our lives. But as we allow the ministry of John the Baptist to work in us, a, a ministry of repentance and, and, and uh, a turning to Jesus and, and then uh, taking hold of Jesus and what he has to offer us, his spirit and his grace, and his circumcision in our hearts, cutting away those fleshly parts, those carnal parts that want to go against God's way and God's will. Like, unless we experience those ministries simultaneously, we're not going to be able to experience the full presence of God in our lives consistently. So in, in, in John the Baptist, we meet the law in person. In Jesus, we, we, we meet the gospel in person, and we need both people's ministry in our lives. Secondly, Jesus' submission to John's baptism reveals the kind of Messiah he is. His first act as an adult is submitting to John the Baptist's ministry. And I believe that in this initial act, it's revealed what the adult Jesus will be like in the rest of his gospel. The first thing Jesus does for the human race is to go down deep into the waters of repentance and baptism. And Jesus' whole life is going to be characterized by this kind of humility. He's going to be a different kind of Messiah than the people at this time need. Bruner writes, It's well known that Jesus ends his ministry on a cross between thieves. It deserves to be as well known that he begins his ministry among sinners in the Jordan River. This is how Jesus achieved his atonement for us. He was at one with us all the way. From his baptism to his execution, Jesus stays low at our level, identifying with us at every point, becoming, uh, becoming as completely one with us in our humanity as in the church's teaching, he is believed to be completely one with God in eternity. This is atonement with us in our humanity, which is essential for our salvation. He atoned on the cross for our sins and for who we are in Adam, and it required his whole life. From, his, from, from, from the time he was born, his baptism, to his death. And he's at one with us. We're in union with Jesus. We are in him by faith. And he's in us by the Spirit of God. How are we accepted uh, to God? It's through the atonement of Christ. He's at one mint with us. And he had to come and identify with us in every way in our humanity. It's interesting that in both his baptism and his death on the cross, his human followers tried to deter him. Here, John the Baptist in verse 14 of Matthew 3 says, But John tried to, to stop him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? And Jesus said, Let it be so now. It's proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. The righteousness was the faithfulness, the faithful love, the loyal love that God in Christ uh, uh, demonstrated to the human race. God is so committed to his promises from prior covenants that he's willing to come in our humanity and walk where we walk. And he assumed everything about our humanity except our sin. In, in Matthew 16 we see Jesus beginning to talk about his death explicitly for the first time on the cross. Look what his response is. From that time on, uh, in, in Matthew 16, verse 21 to 23, let's see the response of one of his closest followers. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. 
Matthew 16, verse 21. Verse 22 and 23, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. God's ways are not like man's ways. And his thoughts are way above our thoughts. And that's why we need to be teachable before God's word and have a humble attitude when we come to the scriptures. And often we don't. We come with preconceived notions how God should work. And even here, like just on everything that ails society, you know, we have preconceived notions of what will bring, make things better. And I believe that many times the church thinks in carnal ways and thinks that through political means, through military means, through coercion, that we are going to see God's purposes fulfilled in this world. The way I believe the way forward is that we need to identify with the humanity around us and be committed to serving sacrificially with the mark of the cross on the church. You know, a lot of people didn't think Jesus, uh, you know, there was a messianic expectation in the first century. There was an expectation that a, that a, that a Messiah was coming. But most of God's people thought that the, the Messiah would be a political military leader. That's what we need. And John's baptism here at the beginning of Jesus' ministry is very revolutionary and subversive to the Israelites. Up to this time, the only people that were baptized and cleansed and immersed in water were outsiders, were Gentiles, who the average Jew in Israel figured needed to be cleansed and washed. We don't need to be washed. But it's interesting, John the Baptist's ministry of baptism is not only for the rank, average rank and file in Israel, but it's for the religious leaders. And look at what he says it, when the religious leaders come out in verses 7 to 10 of Matthew 3. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? You know what? The message of the gospel is counterculture. And it's more counterculture than we realize. He says, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Who are the Sadducees and the Pharisees in first century society? Well, the Sadducees were a part of the clergy elite. They were willing to compromise with Roman authorities. And they would be considered religious liberals today, in today's North American setting. Who were the Pharisees? Well, the Pharisees were the most earnest in seeking to live by God's law. They were considered the religious conservatives of the day. They were seriously minded lay people. You know what? A lot of times the way we look at the scripture, and I've been here 20 years, and our congregation is no different than a lot of other congregations in North America. You know what? When we come to these scriptures... We come through our preconceived lenses a lot of times. And we don't see, we see how this word applies to somebody else and to the other group. But a lot of times we don't see how it, how it applies to us. And the reason why I believe that's the case is that we do not hold together the ministry of John the Baptist together with Jesus. And we need to hear both. The message of John the Baptist needs to be heard by us who claim to be Bible believers and who seek to live under the Holy Scriptures. According to Jesus' teaching that we see recorded in the Gospels, the chief problems of the people of God in the first century were, was not Roman occupation like most religious leaders and most Israelites thought. It's those unclean Gentiles. Gentiles. 
And you know what? It's easy to look today in our culture and think that the biggest problem is that other person or that other group that doesn't agree with us. And we don't see how in our own lives we have failed to identify with the hurts and the pains of people. And we have uh, not walked out faithfully our own baptism in Jesus Christ. And I believe that if we're going to hear the ministry of John the Baptist, we need to hear it. And there are so many barriers in society today in North America. You know, between in the states, between black and white, uh, between Democrat and between Republican. In Canada, there are so many differences. And, and whatever. And it's so easy to stay at the surface level and think that the solutions and the healings are going to all come at a political level or in the world. We just need a stronger military and we just need to bomb the crap out of some areas in, in, in the world. But you know what? That's not going to change the human heart. And it goes so against what the, what, what the message of the cross is. You know, a, a certain nation states they have certain things at their disposal. Like, I'm not saying that, 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 that a country should not have a strong military. I'm not saying that politics is not important. But what I'm saying is that when the church looks to political means and military means more than to the grace of God and to the Spirit of God and to prayer, to see transformation and the change of hearts, something is wrong. And I really believe if John, God rose, rose up John the Baptist-like figures in the evangelical conservative church in North America, he would be run out. And some of you today, I know, don't like what I'm, being, uh, what I'm saying, but the thing is, it's so easy to point that all the problems are, are somewhere else. And we don't look at within ourselves. Like Bruder says, the chief problems of the people of God were and always are the most visible representatives of the people of God. It's the religious leadership a lot of times. And those, not only official clergy, but other leadership within the church. The baptism of jo John is occurring in the Jordan River. And I believe that when it's at the Jordan River, automatically... And when he's coming out of the desert, automatically people's minds in this culture are going back to Joshua. And going back to the wilderness wanderings for 40 years of God's people. In some ways, you know, we can have the sense because of our, 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 our low impact on our culture that the church is in wandering in wilderness. And I believe that one of the reasons why that's happening is that, that like in this, it, it, what's happening right here, the, the baptism in the Jordan River, the Jordan means descending one or descender. And from the source of the Jordan River out, out in Galilee, from Mount Hermon and the streams coming from Mount Hermon, it empties and it goes down and it goes into Lake Galilee and then it continues on the other side of Lake Galilee and goes into the Dead Sea. And it, by the time it goes into the Dead Sea, it's 1,300 feet below sea level. I believe that what we get a picture here is that and what Jesus submitted to the, submission, uh, to the, to the baptism is that there's a real humility here and that Jesus is seen as the new promised land. He, he's the, the promised land or Canaan under the Mosaic Covenant was a land flowing with milk and honey. And so when Joshua took the Israelites through the Jordan River and the Jordan River by faith parted, the Israelites went into the promised land and they began enjoying some of the promises and blessings of God that God had promised Abraham and Moses. Today, under the new covenant, I believe Jesus Christ is the promised one. And in, in Ephesians 1 verse 3, it says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Christ is the fulfillment of those promises to the promised land under the new covenant. 
And you know what? As Christians, we are called to be baptized in Christ and with Christ to our death and resurrection. And you know what happens when we first become Christians and we first get baptized? We give all of ourselves to Jesus Christ as much as we know how to give of ourselves. Just like when we get married, we give of all of ourselves to our spouses. But you know what happens? As we begin walking with Jesus, if we want to keep experiencing the power of the resurrection of Christ, and resurrection blessings, and live a transformative life where we're making a difference with people around us, that we have to live out that baptism in integrity, in a deeper death to self, so that we can experience the resurrection life in a greater measure. You know, in all of our lives, we have challenges. You know, even as we go through different seasons in our lives, you know, like right now, uh, you know, our kids are getting older, they're growing up. And you know what? That's a transition. Sometimes it's really hard to go through that transition. And there's different ways we can respond to the different changing situations. Sometimes it's easy to get resentful or, or uh, uh, just not be happy with things. And you know, one of the things I'm, I'm seeing the Lord is calling myself, and I know my wife too, I think she's dealing with it better than I, is that in different ways i got to die to myself. <laughs> And die to certain expectations I have. Unless I do that, I'm going to give in to resentment. And it's going to compromise my walk with the Lord and my role as a father. And I believe in the same way, you know, we could give in to resentment. You know, there's a lot of resentment and anger in our cultures today, in Canada and North America. And, you know, a lot of people are ticked off. And you know what I get the impression sometimes from Christians? Is that they want to, to, to make loud noise and, and look at all what's wrong and think that they've done what God's called them to do. I don't think that's living out our baptism with integrity. You know what? I'm willing, you know, at my other job, when things I don't see are, 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 are good or godly or whatever, I, 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 in those relationships, I'm... I'm willing and I got the guts to, 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 to bring up things. But you know what? Sometimes we, I just get the impression some Christians think that they can just be uh, loud voices, get angry, and they've done all their good. That, that we're not being faithful. You know, there's a lot of people who say they're prophecy teachers today in North America who are the most popular, who sell the most books, who are the most wealthy, if you look at their ministry of prophecy, never, never do they first address God's people in the ways we need to change. There is no John the Baptist type ministry. It's only foretelling. And, in, and you know what? In, 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 if you look in the ministry of John the Baptist and in jo Jesus' role as prophet, and other prophets like Ezekiel, there is some foretelling. But always, always they address God's people where they're at. And you know what? I believe that a lot of prophet, prophets today are really fortune tellers. They're fortune tellers. And a lot of times what they say doesn't come true. And we put it up with it. And I don't think that's right. I believe that if, if a true prophet came up, he would sound like John the, Pro, uh, John the Baptist or Jesus. And when Jesus came in, in Matthew 23, he didn't all just come with lovey, syrupy words. When he came to his people, are you open to a John the Baptist ministry in your life as well as the ministry of Jesus? Or do you want a false prophet to keep whispering sweet nothings in your ear and thinking that there's going to be no suffering for the people of God. Don't worry. We have a choice to make. We will meet God at the convergence of John the Baptist's ministry and the ministry of Jesus Christ. Amen. We hope this message has blessed you. Feel free to leave us a comment or share your testimony.